Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hope House Church. If you're new to us this morning, you are super welcome. Uh, if you're online, uh, you are also extremely welcome. Uh, so thank you for gathering today. It's just, what a great time of worship. It's good to be gathering again. Isn't it great to be, to be learning to worship again? I think it just feels like, hey, I remember. I remember words are brought. I remember when people share things. I remember the volume in the room as people begin to catch. Hey, this is our God we're singing to. I still believe. And so that last song just caught my heart. Hey, I still believe this. You know, the last two years hasn't changed a thing. I still believe this. So it's just so good to be in that situation. Uh, right now, it is 11 o'clock, and so I should be approaching 20 kilometers through the York Marathon. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've got an injured knee, so I've had to pull out. However, I got an amazing birthday present this morning. So something like, oh, well, never mind, eh? <laughs> Translation... It appears that everything has gone spectacularly wrong and all my dreams are crushed. <laughs> Happy birthday. Yay. <laughs> that is a class T-shirt. What I particularly liked about receiving this T-shirt this morning when I arrived is that uh, somebody uh, um, with vision and prophetic word bought me a medium. It's like a second skin. Um, <laughs> but I'm claiming it. I'm claiming it. I'm owning it and I'm wearing it. Um, uh, so this morning I just want to share a kind of a one-off sermon. Uh, Joe um, Huddleston was supposed to be speaking this morning. Joe, if you're at home watching, I know you were at home watching. Get well soon. We're praying for you. We love you. Uh, and we were looking forward to you. So we'll uh, anticipate soon. Um, oh, that camera there I'm speaking into. Hey, it's all the same. Um, it's the words that count, Joe. We're praying for you. We love you. Uh, and so uh, she phoned me a couple of days ago saying, Joe never goes off sick. He said, I, I can't do cafe and I'm not going to speak on Sunday. Sounded really ill. So do pray for Joe. Um, I was away in a conference, so this sermon got prepared last night at about 11 o'clock. So it's either God or waffle. <laughs> Are you with me? Because it also means I'm likely to be way too blunt because I've not had time to be subtle. So just, just go with it. Just go with it. And just if you're a visitor this morning, just think it's from Barnsley. <laughs> it's just how they say it up here. Okay, I just want to say as well, Julie didn't know um, that uh, a big part of what I want to share this morning is from that psalm. Uh, she genuinely didn't know she was asleep in bed, so I'm not told about chance to chat about what I'm sharing today. Yeah, I've spent the last couple of days surrounded by um, questions about kids. This week, to me, seems to have been full of issues and questions about kids. You know, wanting kids, parenting kids, uh, not having kids, wanting to get rid of kids, um, <laughs> gr growing up um, as God's kids. But this whole thing of growing up and how do we grow up kids and how do we parent and, and what do we do with them just seems to be a whole issue. Every, from the beginning of the week, even to this morning, um, kids and the safety kids and growing kids and, and maturing kids and seeing them develop and go forward has been the conversation. So this is what I, I thought I'd connect into a little bit this morning. I realized we always have, we always have a destination in mind. When we see our kids, we always imagine what could be. We always have a destination in mind. And here's the amazing thing about our God. He always has a destination in mind. He always has an idea, this is where I want to take you. This is, how I want to, this is how I want to take you. This is what I want to take you through. This is the place we're going. And the great thing is on that journey, all the things that Robert prophesied over us this morning, the things that we sang over ourselves this morning, proclaimed before God in our worship, the things that we proclaim in defiance of every spiritual part, the spiritual, spiritual, spirit, spirit, that thing about spirit baddies that won't come out of my mouth this morning. Spirit, what we got? Something and powers, but the word won't come out of my mouth. I'm just, principalities. principalities and powers, that's the one. Just having a slight stroke while I stand here this morning. Um, Hebrews 13 verse 5 says this, I will never leave you or abandon you because our God is the ultimate father. Jesus is our ultimate Lord. He's our King of Kings. He will never leave you or abandon you. So all the things that we've sung, all the things uh, that were proclaimed over us by Rob this morning, all the things we, we, we've, we stood and we, we gathered for, hey, he will never leave you or abandon you. Your faith, though, isn't our destination. It's a way of life with Jesus. It's a way of life with Jesus. We imagined, Julie and I imagined having kids, and we were blessed with them. And then they grow up, and we're still blessed to have them. They were born, 
And I discovered that at that point, the job is not done. It's not done. Babies. We can't just let them get on with it. I mean, I don't mean to be picky or anything, but babies are useless. I mean, it's, just a, it's just a truth. I mean, you might be, oh, no, they're, no, they may be cute, but they're inept to everything. I had to feed them and clean, clean them and, and, like, listen to them and pat them and cover them and swaddle them and, and do it all over again. And then they grew up. And for some reason, they start coming back and they still want patting and feeding and... <laughs> It's my birthday, so do you know what we're doing today? Coming to my house so I can cook dinner for them. I mean, I don't mean to be picky, but how did that happen? The bathroom's upstairs, I'm not changing you. When they struggle to walk, to feed or walk, I didn't walk away from them. I didn't walk away from them. I'd made a commitment to them. They were loved and I didn't abandon them. And God, in the same way, does not walk away from us or abandon us. I began to dream about who they could be. They were learning every moment. And, and I was just at the back. I came, we were just chatting at the moment. saying, said, look at the kids. All the kids are big. They're all growing. And Olivia said, yeah, I need to grow. They're all catching me up. If you don't know Olivia, Olivia's our shortest steward. Um, she's the shortest person in the world, possibly. Um, <laughs> You know when she's one of those people in a crowd that's commanding authority, shouting at your tummy buttons, because you're all up there and she's kind of... But they're all growing around us and we're just sort of saying, wow, the littlies are not littly. They're developing and they're speaking differently and they're, they're trying new things and they're pushing it out. They were learning with every moment. My kids learn with every moment. They were wonderful and full of potential. They, they began incapable but grew in capacity. And it all changes with time to grow and mature. This past week, I've been drawn in to so many conversations about, do you remember? I do remember, and it was wonderful. But I don't want to go back to that. It, you know, somebody once said to me, with each stage, in fact, this person was always sharing their sage wisdom. The one bit I've hung on to is this. When your babies are born, you want, you want them to be babies forever. And then when they begin to crawl, you want them to crawl forever. And then when they begin to walk, you want them to just begin to walk forever. And then when they begin to talk, you want them to talk to you forever. And then when they go to school, you think, oh, don't get any older, but then you love them at five and they go to school. And then you think, oh, don't, be, don't become a teenager. And somehow you learn to love them as a teenager. And you don't want to go back. And, the, and actually, then you think, no, I want my children. I don't want to harm to them as little children. I don't want adults. But then suddenly they're adults and you think, I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't. And so each stage, there's a joy in where they are. I don't want to go back. I enjoy the memories, but I don't want to live there. I want to have conversations asking, do you still dream? What can still be? And it's just like church. I love church, but I don't want to live in, in the dream. I don't want to live in the, sorry, in the past, in the memory. I don't want to just remember, oh, wasn't it good when? Yeah, but it was good when. As good as it may have been, it's gone. I want to live in the dream. I want to grow into the place God has taken us. Up our church was kind of born into this place in 2015 when we began to feel like us, um, we began to step forward, we began to mature. I keep seeing it grow and walk and periodically this child falls over, but it gets back up again. It says somewhere in Proverbs that um, we fall, but we just get back up seven times. That's called for no matter how many times you fall. Scripture says you just get back up, just get back up. And I'm excited as we learn to walk. It fills me with dreams about what can be. And so whenever I, I, I'm with the, the church and we're singing songs like that and we're proclaiming those truths, I still believe, I begin to dream. What do I still believe? I still believe in salvation. I still believe in transformation. I still believe our town can be saved. I still believe our, ta our town can be transformed. And I don't just mean with shiny concrete and marble and brick and polished stone and glass around the town centre. I mean lives transformed for eternity. I see its excitement in baptisms. You know, I, I have loved, I, I am still living on the joy of those baptisms a couple of weeks ago. I, when people are, are growing and finding faith and they make a massive decision like, please will you dip me in water publicly and make a show of me? Even though I'm a real introvert and I'm uncomfortable, you know, because Jesus says, I will do this as a mark of what he's done in my life. 
I'm just excited by that and dream for those people. And then dream for that man. Imagine if we judged a child on the moment it fell over. Or judged a church on the moment it made a mistake. Oh, this child's fallen over, I've done with it. Oh, this church made a mistake, I've done with it. We would never do that, would we? Would we? Christ-likeness is your eventual destination. But your journey will last a lifetime. Something Rick Warren said. I'd love to claim that for my own, but it's not me. Christ-likeness is your eventual destination. We become like Christ. But your journey will last a whole lifetime. What we see is the child's, the church's potential. When we learn to love it, our God loves it. We begin to dream for it, our God dreams for it. So when we learn to love the church the way that Jesus loves the church, begin to dream for it the way that Jesus dreams for it. We have a vision for it the way that he has a vision for it. I don't want to be outside of it or beyond it or to have left it. I want to be part of it. Because that is where Jesus dreams his dreams. That is where he dwells. And I don't want to dwell away from the house of the Lord. We commit to the child now because we're committed to the child's future. You know, when we only look at the now situation of church and decide if it's for us or not, then we've begun to walk away from the future. I don't want to be the kind of person that lives in judgment. I want to be the person that lives in expectation and excitement and belief. I still believe. I still believe God can do this. I still believe he's a God of salvation. I still believe that. I don't want to stop dreaming or to lose that because I will lose my destination. We need to see that the church is alive and growing and God is on the move you know when we're committed to the past we can't be committed to the potential that God brings we stifle growth and maturity we connect to the now version so that we can commit to the growing vision so whatever this church is now whatever this life is now whatever the people are that make it up whatever the backgrounds whatever the strange mismatch it may be whatever the strange joining together we've all found Jesus and we all believe that Jesus is the answer, is the way, the truth, and the life. And so we commit to it now in all its shape so that we can commit to a growing vision. And if anybody's feeling uncomfortable about a crying child, thank God that we have families with crying children. Because that is amazing to me. So if a little child child, don't ever think, oh, kids and children. No, just think, thank you, God, you have brought us families with children. When the kids go out and we've got the countdown, I'll thank God he trusts us with children. Yes. Let's be the best church for children we could ever be. Let's learn to be better with children. Let's, you know, so let's grow our kids' team. Let's get people on that kids' team because they, you know, let's fundamentally, they'll be the ones preaching to you when you're old. Let's make sure they're good at it. Yes. They'll be the ones buying the coffee and doing the building up. Let's make sure they do it well so that in your dotage you can still enjoy church. And you're not one of those people that sits there going, back in my day. <laughs> Anybody that says back in my day will not have children in the church. In their day. What about their day? What about their future? Because everything we do now is investing in their God future. Yeah. That excites me. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 says this. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And what you're doing, where you're working, who you're building up. You've probably worked out by now, this is very much shooting from the hip sermon <laughs> due to lack of preparation, but hey, you know, there you go. So here we go with the Jesus element. That was the introduction finished. Just when you were thought you were 12 minutes in, there's only 10 minutes to go. We want to wrap our kids up to protect them and keep them safe. If that's all we do, then they will never mature. They will never grow. They will never learn. They will never adventure. Their potential will be stifled. And God looks at us and says, oh, I would love to wrap them up and protect them and make it secure and safe and, and put bubble wrap around them and cotton wool. And I know, you, you know, um, let's lead them beside quiet waters. And let's read that again because this is God's heart for us. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. Thank you, God. He leads me beside quiet waters. Oh, hallelujah. He refreshes my soul. Oh, praise you, Jesus. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. The right paths for his name's sake. Where is this going, God? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Oh, that wasn't in, that wasn't in the story. <laughs> the darkest valley. I just just that way, I, you know. Let's just stop. Let's just stop at that bit where it says, "He leads me beside, beside quiet waters. He lays me down in green pastures." Because let's be honest, as Christians, that's what we do. We put put those kind of verses on the side of our, you know, we, we underline them in a Bible. We pin them onto our fridge. We prophesy them. We stop before it says darkest valley. Fear, ev- fear and evil. And here's the deal. For you are with me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my days, he sends us that way. He sends us that way. Yeah. It's his choice. And that goes on effectively to say, our God gives us a feast in the midst of the fight. We rest because this is a burden he's put on us. We are secure because that is where he's taken us. But it is the darkest valley. We are surrounded by fear. We are surrounded by evil. But that's not us. We are not the dark valley. We are not the fearful. We are not the evil. We are God's chosen walking through it. When it's hard, we think it's gone wrong. But what if the hard bit is the road that God sends you on? What if God allows our exposure to those things to mature us? What if? I want to tell you, there's no what if. He does. We may like to be connected with the good stuff, but it's Jesus that will carry us through the hard stuff. You know, if you give me a beach, I don't need a lot of help. Unless somebody wants to make me a cocktail at the same time. I, I can dwell on a beach and I can be myself. But I need to be in the mountains. I need to walk through those valleys. I need to be those places where there is life, where you experience life, where you grow and develop and change. Listen, we walk through it, we don't live in it. So I want you to get hold of that. Even though we are being led through the valley of darkness, we are going through it. We are not dwelling in it. Even though we're surrounded by fear in our world right now, we are passing through it. We are not owning it. Even though evil may pervade all around us, and we saw that with the death of an MP the other day, even though those things happen, we are not dwelling in it, we are passing through it. Yeah. And actually, we are creating a journey, we are creating a signpost that says this way, yeah. so that other people can join us yeah. and pass through that valley. That is what we are called to do. Yeah. That is what it means when it says go into all the world and make disciples. Of course, if you're going into all the world, it's a dark valley. But the point is, we're leading people through it. Yeah. Towards Jesus. Listen, we, we walk through it. We don't live in it because Jesus always has a destination for us. Simply building nice church or nice church buildings or using our, our nice gifts within this room, that is not the mission God has called us to. God has said, get into the valley. Get where there is fear. Get where there is evil. And bring me. Show them me. Point, point to me. Live, live a life of faith so that your life increasingly matures and grows. And as you look like me, people will look to Jesus. They will look to him. Jesus, just because somebody has a gift doesn't mean they've grown in maturity. I just want to say that now. Just because somebody has a gift doesn't mean they've grown in maturity. A person's gift may give them confidence to begin, but it's maturity in Jesus that will sustain them. I don't care how gifted you are. I don't care if you've got the most prophetic gift in the world. I don't care if you've got the amazing gift of healing. I don't care if you can speak in tongues. I don't care if you can do somersaults with Jesus. Whatever the Holy Spirit gift God has given you, if you are not maturing, it is just a gift. It's just a thing. But God wants to grow us in our maturity, in our character, so that we begin to look like Jesus. You see, I could have given all of my toolkit, that I've got all my pliers, my glow lamp, um, my, my razor blades. I could have given them to my kids and said, there you go, you've got all the gifts you need now to be service engineers. And when I came back, they'd have set each other on fire with a blow lamp, they'd have cut each other with the razor blades, 
And I would have said, kids, you just so, you got everything you I gave you all the tools you needed. Look what you've done. They needed to mature. We need to mature. Just because God says, here's the toolkit. It's not about the toolkit. It's about being like him. Yeah. It is about being like Jesus. And one of the things I've discovered over the years, time and time again, is the most gifted people forget they need to be mature. They're so excited by the gift, they stop looking at Jesus and start looking at the gift. And they break everything and break everybody around them. Yeah. And it, it is heartbreaking. So that really is my introduction over now. Um, we need some... This is the trouble is, if you just drop it on me, I'm going to waffle. We need some growing up maturity and mission. That means some growing up experience. So I want to read to you from... It's probably your first note up there now. I've probably finally got to it. Matthew chapter 14. Um, I was at a conference the last two days and it was great. What they did, they said, hey, this is the word of the Lord. Let's honour the word of God. Let's stand up uh, when we read the word of the Lord. So I'm going to be tough on you today. Let's stand up. I'm going to do that thing. Let's stand up, because this is the Word of God. I don't think I'm going to do this every time, but you know, right now, this is the Word of God. Um, this is the one bit you can honour, because I've not made it up. I've not tried, this is just God's Word. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while they dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It's I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come. He said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have a little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Amen. Now you can sit down. That made me, feel, made me feel important. It made, made the word of God feel important. Not me. That was the word of God that needed to feel important there. I, I, I particularly love, you know, we, we, I just, oh, this is all about Peter, this story, except it's not. This story is all about Jesus. Yeah. And I just want to remind you that Jesus walked, Peter walked to Jesus, and when he began to sink, he didn't go, he began to sink, and then he walked back to the boat with Jesus. Any of you ever done that? Right, well, stop complaining about Jesus, about Peter, and say, oh, Peter's not very good, is he? You've never done it. With or without Jesus holding your hand, you've never done it. Number one, Jesus sends us ahead, but always to a destination. I love this. Jesus is alone with God. His disciples, obviously, are going to need him with them while they're sent out. No, they're on their own. Just understand this from He has sent them on the... Jesus' word... Is to go, go to the other side, go to the destination. Jesus never says, go and bob about on the water. Go and drift around for a while. Now, that's the destination. You know what this is about. You know what you're called to. Go and do it. That is Jesus' word to disciples. You know, but the thing is, we want Jesus in front of us every step of the way. I at least want him asleep in the boat for when the storm comes. It's the very least I want. Ideally, I want him in the very large boat just in front of me. Just make, you know, cutting away. But that's not what Jesus does. He sends them out while he's alone with Father. They're out there. So he's matured them to a point. They're equipped. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. His word was go. And that is all the light we need. We're not sent out into darkness blinded. His word is a lamp to my feet. Go. There's a destination. The destination is to be the character of Christ. Is to look like him. And to live that in the valley. Jesus prepa prepares you through the journey to be prepared for that destination. You know, without the journey, without the storm, without crossing over, crossing over, without being sent out there, you will never mature. You will never grow. You will never begin to look like Jesus. If I just stick around... And just indulge the Jesus stuff. 
Have you ever seen a kid that just sits in the biscuit tin? You know what happens? We need to be out there. We need to be living that Jesus. Listen to this. These were gifted sailors. Many of them were professional sailors. They had all the gift they needed to cross over. What they needed was the maturity and faith to trust Jesus. That they had a destination. Gifted people often confuse giftedness with maturity. So let that be our number one. Jesus sends us ahead, but always to a destination. So my second thought is I see this. Number two, Jesus sees us in the, There's only three of these, so you're all right. Number, th- number two, Jesus sees us in the storm because Jesus sends us through the storm. Oh, how about that? Jesus says, go, go, go that way, guys, across the middle. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to spend a bit, of G- a bit, bit of God time alone. You know which way to go. You're professional sailors. Cross the lake in the storm alone. You've got this. When Jesus says to us, go into all the world, he knows he's sending us into a storm. Scripture is full of the reality when we take the good news of Jesus into the world, it will be a storm. It will not always be received. It will not always be wanted. It will bring criticism. It will bring persecution. You know, I sometimes think to myself, why as a church are we not being persecuted? And I think, because maybe we're just not going far enough. Maybe we're not pushing hard enough. The destination is his presence. Matthew 28, go and surely I'll be with you. Listen, if you don't go through the storm, you don't reach the destination. If you don't go through the storm, you can't encounter Jesus' presence is what we're going to come to in a moment. You can't encounter Jesus' presence if you live safe. Staying here or going to your destination is determined by you knowing Jesus or you trusting Jesus. You're going to come with me on that one again? Because all of you that are sage are going, hmm, hmm. Yeah, I wrote that down. I thought, hmm. And then I thought, hold on a minute. And I nearly took it out. Staying here in the nice place, in the good place, in the warm place, in the pleasant valley where the nice streams of water are, where I can lay down. I can find that by knowing Jesus. But I can go through the storm and grow mature by trusting Jesus. See, the disciples would have still been the disciples if they'd waited for Jesus on the shoreline until he'd done praying. And then they'd have probably been told off for not crossing over, but he'd have got in the boat and they crossed over together. But because they crossed over, they went out. They learned something. They grew. Guys, it's not enough to just give your life to Jesus and say, I know him. The real living happens when we trust him. You know, people say, why do, you know, on a practical, you know, why do you do things? Because I want to experience living. You know, why have I done rock climbing? Because I want to experience living. Nearly dying makes you appreciate not doing. It's a great feeling. Running a marathon and feeling your heart beating, your eyeballs, is like, you know you're alive. I mean, you think you might not be. But when you get the medal at, at five hours and 18 minutes, amazing, and you get the medal at the end, you feel alive. You're breathing, it's great. When you don't give in and you carry on and you go through the chemo and keep going back again and again and again, you know you're alive in Christ. When we trust Jesus, when life falls apart and the marriage is a disaster or the kids are a nightmare or the job's just gone or the bills can't be paid, But we keep going back to Jesus. We say, I'm going to go through this storm. I'm not going to deny who Jesus is. I'm not going to walk away. I'm not going to proclaim this is unfair. You know, Job in the Old Testament, everything went wrong. And he could have proclaimed, it's not fair, God, this is your fault. Not worshipping you anymore, you've spoiled it. But because he didn't do that, because he continues to proclaim, my God is good, I still believe. He went through the storm and was doubly blessed. Do you think he grieved his original family that he lost? Of course he did forever. But God blessed him. I heard this the other day and it's true. You can have comfort or growth, but you can't have both. We can be a comfortable church or we can have growth, but we're not going to have both. Oh, I'm being naughty today, aren't I? (laughs) Never ask me to preach at short notice. Your life can be comfortable or you can grow in Christ, but you can't have both. It's dead true. 
Oh, I like coming to church sometimes. It feels nice. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel, feel spiritual. You can have comfort or growth. But you can't have both. Being in the calm or being in the storm is the difference between knowing Jesus or trusting Jesus. And I want to trust him. Number three, Jesus calls us to another level in the storm. Jesus calls us to another level in the storm. Are you with me? Or are you all thinking, blimey? Is it a comfortable church down the road? Which is the comfortable connect group? I'm going to go to that one. Don't answer that. Here's what happens. The storm will swamp us with fear or fill us with faith. When you're in the boat in the middle of the storm and fear and evil is all around you, you will be swamped by that fear or you will be filled with faith. You know, the fear is real. Anybody ever felt afraid? Or do you trust Jesus so you never feel afraid? If anybody puts your hand up, now I'm going to go, no, I thought you were going to put your hand up. You were scratching your ear, weren't you? <laughs> of course, I get afraid. You must, I, I, I'm, I'll, I'll live half my life afraid. But I trust Jesus. Yeah. Not always as I should, but that's my default. So, Lord, I want to trust you. I'm not going to be swamped by fear. I trust you. You know, I, I, I've got to tell you, I've done some insane things in my life, and this is, this is not a brag fest. Well, it is. Um, brag. It's a humble brag. Um, no, it's a humble declaration of trusting God, and it works. So, when I asked Julie out, everybody looked at me. No, no, she's been around a long time. We know what she's about. She's ace. You're new. I actually had that said to me. Who do you think you are? You're new. We know Julie, she's gifted and capable, and she's strong, she'll eat you alive. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, she gnawed a few times, but <laughs> I, think, I think we've said, let's trust Jesus, and that one worked. Yeah. 37 years on Wednesday, that's good, isn't it? Can't believe they're all thinking, but Paul, you can't get married at 10. Yeah. <laughs> when I... Um, Went to Bible college, I believe God had called me into ministry, but I wasn't prepared to go into ministry until I prepared, I, I felt I'd got to set time aside. I've got to give some time to God. It was like an offering. Lord, I give you this time so I'm properly prepared or as well prepared as I can be. I've got to tell you, you're never prepared. Um, three years of Bible college just meant I knew a lot about Hebrews and Greek things. Um, but that meant giving up a job. That meant not working, just trusting Jesus for three years, three or four years. And that was great. And here's the thing. I was offered comfort at the same time. The, the, the week I was offered a place at, at college in uni, I was also offered an amazing job with a company car. The job I'd wanted, the type of job I'd wanted so long. And I'm thinking, well, you know, God, I, can do, I could do a correspondence course to do that. And then I, I, I was about a month from the end of my course when I was taken to one side and said, we could probably offer you a job, but not be for between seven and ten years. So until then, you'll need to go back to normal work. And I'm like, yeah, but I know what God's called me to. So I could have gone for the normal work, which I was then offered, the comfort job. Or I said, actually, I believe in God. This is the right thing to do. I'm just going to sit here and wait. I'm not going to make a fuss. I'm just going to wait on God. And he opened that door. Yeah. And I can tell you stories like that again and again, where it is fearful. But trusting God is worth it. Trusting God means you see God in action. And I know there are countless stories like that around this room. Stories of healing, of transformation, of children living and thriving. When we're fearful, but we trust God. And I've got to tell you, it's not easy to trust God in a storm. Because it's still a storm. And you can still feel the water coming over the side of the boat. If the water's coming over the side of the boat and I'm getting wet, there's probably something I should do. Probably just get out of the boat. Fear in the, in the storm determines how we see Jesus. Is my trust in Jesus greater than my fear? Because if my fear is greater than my trust in Jesus and I see Jesus, here's what happens. It's a ghost, the disciples cried in fear. It's a ghost. The disciples saw a ghost because of their fear. Peter saw his saviour because of his faith. Yeah. I want to be the person that, that sees Jesus in the storm and says, call me to you, Lord. 
knowing Jesus or trusting Jesus. Jesus isn't in the safety of the boat. He's in the center of the storm. Isn't that frustrating? Yeah. Wouldn't it be good if Jesus like, did the apparition thing and appeared in the back of the boat and said, calm. And the wind stopped. And the wind. He's done that once. He's, he's, like, he's, he's got that one. This is one bigger. Jesus is dwelling in the eye of the storm. And he calls you out the safety of the boat. I've been out of the boat with Julie on loads of occasions and sometimes we've got it wrong, sometimes we've got it right. Uh, but I tell you what, Jesus never got it wrong and always got it right. Yeah. Right now we could be walking in a dark valley, sinking in a storm, but that's where we find the presence of Jesus and his power to catch us up and to give us a destination. Listen to this. The focus of this story isn't Peter walking on the water. The focus on this story, in this story is Jesus in our storm. You understand that, don't you? The whole of Scripture isn't about the characters. The whole of Scripture is about the story of Jesus becoming king. The Jesus dominance, Jesus lordship, Jesus the saviour, Jesus the messiah. And in the darkest storm, this is like Jesus and that saying, look, prophetically, look what can happen. And this is just wind and waves. You know I can deal with wind and waves. So what can I do in your life? Anybody who thrives on attracting attention, oh, look at me. See, Peter wasn't saying, look, in, look at me, look at me. He was saying, I want to go to Jesus. Anybody who thrives on attracting attention in their direction needs to sit down in the boat until they can grow up and get out of the boat and walk to Jesus. None of us are doing this to attract attention to ourselves, for our own fame, for our own celebrity, for our own recognition. Anything we do, we do because we want to reach Jesus and we want to show who Jesus is. And what happens with Peter? He shows who Jesus is. Because when he can't do it, Jesus catches him. Yeah. We can try to do this life knowing Jesus, but, we, but saying why we cannot do things is not trusting Jesus. We can live life to the full in abundance by proclaiming we can in Jesus. The only way to, get out that, to do this is to get out the boat and walk on the water. But when you walk on the water, you walk in a storm. Uh, I was very disappointed some years ago when that famous magician, you know the weird guy? Um, he, he tried to walk on water on the River Thames. Well, you know, even if you'd done it, I'm thinking, yeah, but it's a river. There's no storm, there's no howling gale, there's no waves, and you've got makeup on, lights, camera, action. You're waiting. No, Jesus did it in a storm. If he'd have walked out across like some massive English Channel in a storm, then Darren, I'd have been impressed. Jesus says, get out of your boat, follow me. We get out of the boat with all our fears and baggage, trusting Jesus will reach out and catch us up. Peter began to sing. Yeah, he did. And that's that one of the best moments in the world. Because, oh, you doubted me, you drowned. No. no. Jesus didn't let him drown because he had a wobble. He grabbed his hand and walked with him. Yeah. Yeah. How good is that? But Peter needed to know. You imagine if Peter had walked to Jesus, say, hey, mate, how are you doing? And then walked back to the boat. It'd have been, oh, look at me, I walked on water. Yeah. No, Jesus walked on water and Jesus saved me in the midst of a stormy water sea. You know, he, he rescued me, he reached out yeah. and grabbed me. Yeah. So the focus becomes not Peter, but Jesus. Yeah. No. The weakness is Peter's, the strength is Jesus. Yeah. The failure is Peter's, the victory is Jesus. Yeah. It began failing because he began trying. He got out of the boat and got caught up by Jesus. He reached him. That's where Jesus is going to grab your hand and lift you up. When you get out of the boat and get into a dangerous place, step out into the outrageous. Jesus, Peter cries out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Whenever we say, Lord, save me, we are never failed. Yeah. If your heart truly reaches out and says, Lord, save me, Jesus responds. You know, I love you get the sense of immediacy. Peter has barely got the words out of his mouth when suddenly he feels Jesus holding him. Boom. It's like Jesus has already begun to reach out before Peter's even thought to shout out. We don't need Jesus on the shore. We don't need Jesus in the boat. We need Jesus on the water. Yeah. Yeah. Get on the water. It's insane. It's wonderful. It's, it's amazing. It's exhilarating. It's frightening. But it's where the presence of Jesus is, and it feels wonderful. You know, being around the glory and presence of Jesus. When we see him do the impossible, how good is that? You know, the building that we're dreaming of needs Jesus to catch us. 
We are doing everything as a church to destroy it right now. We're committing to things and promising architects things and speaking it up and telling people what we're going to do. And we're saying, we are believing God for this. We are believing that, that we are going to build something amazing with brilliant youth facilities and brilliant children's facilities, brilliant community facilities. Why are we doing that? Because we want to serve and bless our town. Because we want to say, hey, this is how good our God is and we want to share him with you. We want you to know Jesus is. We're doing these massive, massive things. And we're so excited about it. But here's the deal. It's not possible. It is not possible. Jesus catches. Jesus catches. Do you need Jesus to catch you today? Are you out there on the water? Are you wanted to get out there on the water? Are you just in the storm? Have you just found yourself in the dark place, in the valley? You know, a gifted person, no matter how good your history has been, no matter how gifted you may be, a gifted person who isn't broken in the storm thrives on the attention they're given. A broken person in the storm doesn't want people to see more of them. They want people to see more of Jesus. So Peter wanted everybody to see who Jesus was and caught him. You know, whether it's our building next door, please God, nobody say what an amazing church that is. Please God, nobody say what a great pastor Paul is. Please God, everybody say, what an amazingly faithful God they have. Amen. Yeah. What incredible love of Jesus those people share in our town. How, how do these people care for us this way? Where does this love come from? It comes from Jesus. That's why we do these things. Listen, we walk through it. We don't live in it because Jesus always has a destination. We reach it when he is our focus. I genuinely have nearly done. Sorry, I've just looked at my watch. What if my fear sinks me in the storm? I'm going to throw some things out to you. Maybe you'll be brave enough as I say some of these things. You might even stand up and put yourself on the water. You know, if I say something right now and it fits your life, have the courage to stand up and say, this is me getting out of the boat. If just for a moment, I'm getting out of the boat. So I'm going to throw just various things that I've written down. It's off the top of my head this morning when I was having breakfast. Um, people have all types of storm. Marriages. Is anybody married here? Don't tell me your marriage is perfect. If you're one of those people that's been never out in 48 years, no, because one of you has been totally suppressed. <laughs> yeah. Marriages. Does divorce hang over you? Single parenthood become a pressure. Parenting. Finance. Your past sin. Your present sin. Illness that you carry addictions that you have, attitudes that you carry. Wow, we've got some saints in this room this morning. I'm going to start from the beginning. This, this ought to take about 50% of people. Are you married? Right, it's all right to get out of the boat. I'm not going to make you, but you know, if you're married, you might need to be out of the boat. Okay, you, you need... No, not because it's bad, because you need Jesus in it. You need Jesus' presence in your marriage. Are you divorced? Have you been divorced? You need Jesus to bring some healing into that situation. Are you a single parent? And hey, God, I'm in this by myself. You're not. Jesus is in there. Are you a parent? We're in this by ourselves. No, you're not. Jesus is in there. My finance. Oh, my days. There isn't any. Jesus is there. Your past sin that you can't let go of. Jesus has forgiven it. Yeah. You're healed from it. Our present sin. Jesus can heal you from it and release you from it. Your illness that you carry, Jesus can be present. Your addictions that you have, I don't care whether that's gaming or alcohol or drugs or a thousand and one other things. Your attitudes, your history. We all have things that we need to get out of the boat for and trust Jesus for because the storm rages. The storm of the call fear of God's call over your life. I believe there are people in this room that know God has called them, but they're fearful to get out of the boat. They'd rather be in a safe place. People are afraid to give generously. You know, we have this, this dirty word, tithes, and people are afraid to give to God, to pray. I'm afraid to pray. This, uh, let him be present in that. Let your prayers point to him. To read or even own a Bible. Okay, there are people in this room who need to get out of the boat and read the Bible every day. It's the Word of God. There are people in this room that need to own a Bible that's possibly not digital so you can manifestly, physically hold the Word of God. 
There are people that need to bring prophetic word to God's people. There are people that need the presence of God through the Holy Spirit in their lives. Not just the nice salvation, but in filling an outpouring, an overwhelming of the Holy Spirit that brings the fruit of the Spirit and the gift of the Spirit so that you can build others up, so that you are empowered to be a witness, to step up and step out in preparation, to serve, to lead, to put others first. Shall we have the band back up, please? And if the band, you just appreciate the band for a moment. We often call them back up at moments when we're looking to God. Listen, maybe Jesus wants you on the water today in your life. If it's not scary, you can sit down now, that's okay. If it's not scary, getting there, it's not God's destination over there. If your life is not scary, then maybe you're not going where God wants you. Go through the thing, go through the thing that scares you, knowing that Jesus is at the center with you. Okay, so, Lord, we pray for Sue, who's not in the room. She's gone to fetch the kids right now. But we pray for Sue, who's just left. The, okay, Sue's, Sue's um, elsewhere. But we pray for Sue right now, Lord, that as she's waiting for surgery, life-changing surgery, potentially life-altering surgery, Lord, we pray that you'll be in that storm with her, that she will know your presence. Yeah. For my Julie, she goes, ongoing treatment, that she will know, she will know your presence in the storm. For people here whose relationship is struggling, we pray that you'll be with them in the storm. For people facing finance and pressure, you'll be with them in the storm. For people facing unemployment, you'll be with them in the storm. For people needing to hear your direction, you'll be with them in the storm. For people carrying addictions, they would reach out to you and they would not sink, but you would grab them. You will catch them up in their storm. When Jesus gives us a big promise, a destination, he gives us big problems and a storm so that we can grow through it. Because he wants you more able to survive the storm. Why? Because he might send you into a bigger storm with a greater destination and a greater presence and a greater potential. If you are still breathing, the storms are not ending. If you are still breathing, the promises are still coming. If you're still breathing, God is still at work and God is still present. If you're still breathing, he still wants to pour his Holy Spirit on you. Why don't we stand up together? We're about to worship God in a moment. I want to get straight into that, just to worship God. There is power to save people in his presence. Even your storm can be about real people connecting with our real God in real life. Your storm story can become your good news story of what Jesus can do. As you trust him, God is giving you a story to share on Monday morning. So if you've got illness or fear or doubt or loss or pain, you have a story to tell people on Monday morning. But this is what my Jesus does. This is how Jesus carries me through it. If you're grieving and have had loss, then you can say, this is my Jesus who I'm trusting. And you have a good news story to share on Monday morning. You know, people often think, I've got nothing to share. I've got nothing to give. I'm not good enough. You know what? You're breathing and you're here so in your storm, you're trusting Jesus. You're learning to trust him. And that is a great Monday morning story. That is a great story to share. That's what we call to serve God and serve others with your gift. God will draw the, la- the right people at the right time to grow his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. To build this church, to build his church. And Hebrews 13, verse 5, no appeal, no call forward this morning. Just encourage one another, tell each other your stories, pray for one another as we're doing coffee, just be with one another. But Hebrews 13, verse 5 says this, in the middle of your storm, in the middle of your dark valley, in the middle of surrounded by fear and evil, Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you or abandon you. That is our God. That is our Jesus. Do you know him? Do you trust him? I'm going to pray this prayer quickly about knowing him. And then we're going to proclaim in this last song worship that we trust him. Lord Jesus, I know I have done things wrong in my thoughts, words and actions. I've begun to sink. There are so many good things I've not done. There are so many wrong things I have done. I am sorry for those wrong things and turn from everything I know to be bad. That's the moment we cry out to God and say, Lord, will you catch me? You gave your life for me on a cross, his storm. And gratefully, I give my life back to you. Now I ask you to come into my life. Grab my hand, Lord. 
Come in as my saviour to clean me. Come in as my Lord to lead me, to take me to that destination. And I will serve you. I will trust you all the remaining days of my life. Amen. Let's not just think on these things. Let's live them. Let's worship God together.